this is on a uh, career. It's what what Nathan asked me to talk about. Um, I have to get appropriately angry. So as most of my uh, my presentations are fueled by rage and disdain towards technology in general. Uh, I'm Theo, and I made a career of this stuff, whatever that is. Um, before I jump into that, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Uh, it's great to see somebody from the ACM here. I am a, a very active member in the ACM, and that I don't ever go to the meetings here. But um, I sit on the um, the AC, the uh, the editorial board of the ACMQ, and I sit on the um, ACM uh, professions board. Um, so if anybody in this room, anybody know what ACM is? Yeah, is anybody here a member of the ACM? There are like five, and six, seven. There is a reason for that, and it's a legitimate reason. Is because the ACM is a whole bunch of academics with their heads up their asses. All right. So, um, and uh, no offense to all those academics that are great out there. Uh, actually, friends with very many of them. Uh, but the the kind of the point is, is the general gist of the ACM <clears throat> is an organization for the industry of computing, not for you. Right, which is kind of stupid, right? Because everything that happens in academia to evolve computer science trickles down and gets deployed somewhere, right? It's a practitioner's trade to actually deploy that. So the professions board at the ACM, we're responsible for trying to make the ACM uh, more appropriately aligned towards the practitioner's needs. Um, and I think we do a decent job of that. If you haven't checked out Q, uh, it's Q spelled the correct way, Q-U-E-U-E.acm.org. Um, it's a practitioner's uh, magazine. It feeds a little bit of stuff into the communications of the ACM, which is the main publication of ACM. Um, I highly suggest uh, becoming an ACM member. I highly suggest convincing your employer to pay for it. Um, we do that at OmniTI. It's one of the benefits. Um, I would rather have an, edu uh, an educated engineer than an engineer. Um, so so at, at OmniTI, that's a benefit. You don't have to pay for it. You just have to ask, and you get an ACM membership. Um, so, a career in what? Right. So, what's what is that? What is a career? A career is a pursuit, right? It's a willingness to mature. It's patience to become exceptional. It's a little bit different than a job, right? So, when you think about that, and you think about op school, and you want the quick fix, uh, I'm not a fan of that. So, I, I am a fan of op school. Um, but the idea that I, I want to be able to jump in and learn what I need to know, learn and get out, to me that's a skills refresher more than anything, and that can be one of the, the service points of, of op school. But, but the idea of, of an education around that is something that's actually quite robust. Um, and if you remove that aspect, that robustness of education, um, you, you're left with someone you probably don't want to employ so much. You're relying on cleverness. You're relying on intuition instead of education. Right? And education has a tremendous amount of value. Even if you're self-taught, that just means you have to be really good at self-teaching. Right? And it doesn't mean you know, education versus self-teaching isn't something that, that are opposites. Um, those things are orthogonal. So what I see a lot is uh, this, right? wanted expert in Java. Right? And what I see <clears throat> are applications that look like this. I learned that in school, I had one class, I graduated last year, uh, and I am applying for the expert position of Java engineer, right? And I don't know how many people here do hiring, you've seen this, absolute crap, <laughs> so, so that's bullshit, right? And I think we need to call that out for what it is, right? So when you have someone who does operations as an engineer, we get a lot of this, I may alienate some people in the room, uh, but we get a lot of, uh, given, given that we're in the D.C. metro area, we're in uh, Fulton, which is halfway between D.C. and and, Mar uh, and Baltimore, we get a lot of applicants that are government employees that have, that, you know, they have 15 years of experiencing do in, in operations doing one thing. It's like they restarted IIS every day for 15 years. And if that was a craft, I think you're probably the best craftsman ever, but that's really not what we're looking for, right? We're looking for um, good knowledge of, like, like, there's a question. Computers, how do they work, right? And if you don't know the answer to that question, um, there's a lot of learning. Uh, and I had nine years uh, in the computer science program at Hopkins and uh, a lot of years uh, watching things break uh, in, in, in beautiful explosions uh, on the internet. 
with hundreds of thousands of requests a second going through them, and uh, I learned something today. Right? It's it's not that I understand how everything works. Uh, today I got exposed to the uh, to the uh, destination client entry cache in the IP table of Illumos as it exhausted. We had an eight gigabyte table of connected clients, and it stopped working. So I had no idea what that was. Had to explore that. That's something I learned today, um, and it's been many many years. So the idea that anybody's really an expert um, in knowledge is kind of a silly thing, right? You don't want someone who knows how to do things. You want to know. You want to find someone who knows how to figure out how to do things, right? And they have good track records of of, of looking at problems and knowing how to pursue and solve them. Um, it's one of the most valuable things I learned in college was going into a class that I didn't know the subject matter for, um, had to figure out how to solve the problems, and most importantly, didn't like the subject. It was the most valuable lesson I ever learned in life was how do I still get an A if I don't want to do this? Because right, when you go to work, not every single moment is going to be awesome. One of those problems is going to suck, and you still have to do just as good a job. So that's what I, what I learned. Luckily, 90% of my classes were awesome. It was the other 10% that were really valuable. So, to be truly excellent in your career, what do you have to do? You have to treat it as a craft, right? And then you have to become a craftsman. Uh, and that's through experience, you learn discipline, and through practice, you achieve excellence. Um, so this is nothing to do with computer science, right? This has to do with uh, making your job a craft, right? Making your job a career. Uh, if you're going to be a glass blower, I would imagine that would look exactly the same. Right. If you want to be a professional martial artist, that will look exactly the same. If you want to be a writer, um, you need to be totally different from me, and that would look exactly the same. So uh, there are a couple steps. It's not that hard to do this. So the first thing is to educate yourself. Um, this just is a continual field of study. Right. Every single day you can learn something. I read thousands and thousands of lines of C code today, a little bit brain damaged from it. Um, that's what the beer is for. It's very good. Um, you constantly want to stay up on these trends. So the idea of going and learning about all of this technology and feeling prepared, um, what you're really doing is preparing yourself for learning for all the shit you didn't know tomorrow um, because all of this changes. right? The technology that we deploy today looks so radically different from the stuff we had five years ago. Radically, radically different. Um, so the second one, which most people struggle with, this is the one that I see most people in our industry struggle with, and that probably has to do with the audience that I deal with. I've got a lot of conferences with a whole bunch of people who want to be awesome in a year or awesome in two years instead of an awesome in 10 years. Um, so being disciplined, right? Just being really tenacious at getting better every single day and being patient with that. Um, step three, you got covered because you're already here. Uh, learning, sharing with your peers. It's going to conferences, participating in working groups. Um, getting with people who know less than you, making sure you stay around people who know more than you. Um, all of those things are really important for enriching all of, of your problem domain, right? Your understanding of that. Um, and I think most important, um, being patient, it's because because experience really takes a lot of time. So there's this old adage that um, um, ex you know experience means making good judgments, um, and experience comes from making bad judgments. Right, so experience itself is sort of like a paradox. You can't get it without like working through it. Uh, it's both a, a verb and a noun. It's kind of weird like that. Um, you have to be able to make mistakes. So the idea of going in to learn something, right, to, to go like, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to go learn it. I'm going to follow the steps, and then I'll be done. Um, I hear a lot of people complain. We do a lot of work with um, uh, Illumos, which is uh, um, if anybody thought Oracle totally killed uh, oh, open Solaris, uh, they did. Um, but someone managed to fork it before that, and and it is really the the dream of Open Solaris still living. It's like Illumos. Uh, it's very different, uh, and it doesn't work like uh, Gentoo, or it doesn't work like CentOS, and it doesn't work like Ubuntu. So when you download Ruby and you install the gem, and it doesn't find the library in the right path because the person who wrote that Ruby gem says libffi always should be in this location. They're an idiot first. Um, I think if they said, I didn't know it was in other locations, I should fix that, then that's really, really good. Um, but no, it's no, it's your system's broken. You know, fix your system to look like my Linux box. And I said, well, I can get it to panic more often if you'd like me to 
look like your Linux box. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so there's this there's this thing where it doesn't work, and we get a lot of people who are like, oh, I just need it to work. It's like, well, if you're always following directions and watching the outcome, it's like following the directions, and you know the output is supposed to be this. I don't know if everybody's done a quick learning addicts programming book, where it's like you type this in and you run it, and it should print out hello world, and you're like, oh. Awesome, it printed out Hello World. You learned how to type. It's really all you learned how to do, right? Unless you screwed it up and it didn't print he Hello World. That's the best case scenario, is that you mistype something. Because then you have to debug, right? And that's how you learn something. So embrace the debugging exercise, right? So when your box is broken, do not turn it off and turn it on again to fix it, right? That is not how you learn. Um, you have to find the root of the problem. You really need to understand why things are broken. Besides, that's the really interesting part of the job anyway. So, a career in this stuff. This stuff is web operations. That's what we're supposed to be talking about today. Um, I don't know how many people feel like they do that. I don't ever feel like I do that. Uh, most people say they do something else, right? They do web development, um, systems engineering, uh, systems administration, site reliability engineering, UI develop development, usability, something like that. Uh, I think the interesting part is, is that once you've embraced this movement, which I think most people are, all of that turns into bullshit, right? You don't really have that job. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with someone who refuses to clean out the coffee maker when it says clean me, right? I don't know if anybody has that jackass in their office. You probably do, right? And everybody's got one. So you go in and you're in front of the coffee maker and it says clean me. So what do you do? You grab the thing, you rinse it out, and you put it back in because you're part of the team, right? It's like, well, that's not on my systems administration job list, so fuck you, right? I mean, like, do you want to work with somebody like that? Probably not. The interesting part is that all of our pieces of our jobs in technology, they tie together in a really, really fascinating, intermingled way where everything I do affects everyone else directly, not indirectly. So the stuff that I run, the packages I install, the way I manage systems, the way I write code, the way it gets deployed, the way it gets monitored, all of that stuff affects everyone directly. People get woken up, people get angry, uh, people, teams break and make on those things. So you can't just be one of those. You can be primarily responsible for one of those. Um, and the web changed all of that, right? And the cloud made us realize it. So specifically, SaaS. So this whole software as a service movement is uh, a clever name for an old thing. If anybody remembers, I don't know, everybody looks. Everybody looks old. This is great. <laughs> this is a nice thing about systems administration groups. I feel so old and crufty. Like, I like those kids these days. Uh, I have three daughters, so it, I, I get 20 extra years on my life. Uh, so uh, so I'm, 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 I'm artificially 20 years older than I am. Um, but uh, SAS used to be called ASP, Application Service Providers, back in the day. Um, they are absolutely no different. They provided an application as a service, kind of like somebody provides software as a service. So there's really no difference in that. Uh, the interesting part is that nobody today has a brochure website. Uh, honestly, you wouldn't have a job if your employer did. Um, there is a rich application being provided over the web or over some other um, facility, um, and that makes your website SaaS. You are providing software to your users, right? Your product is made up of users, and it has users, and it has systems, uh, and it has features. So your product also only has one copy. Generally speaking, there's one copy in service. You may have dev environments, you may have staging environments, but generally speaking, your copy has one. So anybody here work for a ship software company? You have a lot of copies. So very, it's a little bit different. It's a different mentality there, and there's a different focus. And DevOps, I think, in a lot of ways, has a very different application in software engineering companies that ship product. Um, <laughs> The risks of moving fast are awesome when you ship, you know, 15,000 copies wrong and they don't work. Um, so this is slightly different. Um, but that, but generally speaking, in SaaS, you have one copy and that has to evolve. It has to compete um, and it has to perform and it has to deliver. Right. Agile. I don't really care about waterfall or Scrum or Kanban. I don't really care. Um, they all work when applied correctly um, with those are the things that have to do. And if you all understand where they apply. But if you don't have really good human processes in your organization for doing things, um, you will not evolve. And that's the most important thing. You'll end up focusing on delivering or performing, and your comp competition will evolve. 
So you do really well today, but then you don't have the features and you don't have the user interest and you don't have the experience um, that your competitors have. So the idea of shipping very, very fast, uh, being able to make changes with low risk and deploy them is one of the things that DevOps really enables. Right? And that's why the idea of I'm a usability engineer versus I'm a systems administrator kind of all falls apart because you're moving too fast on a team. It's like, it's like watching, I don't know if anybody watches professional football, I'm kind of an addict, right? It's like having a right guard on the team and their job is to block one guy, right? So the play changes and they're like, well, fuck it, I'm out, right? So I'm going to block this guy even though that's not important anymore, right? No, of course that's not their job. They're on the team. They want to win, right? They're all focused on the same goal. He has to change his strategy, right? He has to help someone else. He has to move. He has to change. He has to play a different position. And that's all really important. And we need to be able to do that. And everybody on the team needs to accept that. So it must operate. That's the way to summarize all of that. And that's what DevOps is really about. So what does it take? It takes DevOps. Okay, so now I'll tell you that DevOps is bullshit too. <laughs> so, I like that. Um, I, I, I think it's not fair, kind of like life. It's not wrong. Um, DevOps is incomplete. Uh, and I think it's really interpreted, it, it, it interpreted wrong. Um, and it, it's far too isolated. So what we really need is star ops. And because we have software engineers in the room, that we look at that or that, <laughs> right? So everyone in your organization needs operational mentality. Right? It's not just software engineers and operations people. It's also sales. If you want to look at an operationally oriented mindset, Look at a good sales organization. They will have a tremendous amount more respect for everyone else in the organization when they realize they're as operationally focused as they are, right? Because their operational goals are to generate revenue out of a sales funnel and they don't get paid or work there anymore when they don't, right? They're highly incentivized to do that one thing. Very operationally focused. The interesting part is that, generally speaking, the rest of the company is there to enable them and enable the marketing and enable the product the, the product delivery to the user. Yet I see IT people like focused on oh the server crashed, it's my most important thing. I'm like, you haven't tied that to an operational output of the company, right? That's not is it important? You haven't a answered that question. Um, so I would encourage everyone here on the tech side to step back and have more conversations with people on the business side so that you actually understand the systems that you run, the systems that you're responsible for operating, what do they do, right? Understanding how they work, that's your domain job, right? Understanding what they do for your company, what value they add, what business value they add, who they enable in your company. If you can't say, so-and-so is going to be mad when this goes down, Bob is going to call me because Bob is going to be mad when this system goes down or this system underperforms, then you don't really understand how it ties into business function. And that makes you more valuable which makes it a lot easier to have a career and have them send you to conferences and, and do all the awesome things. Um, so your job is to build systems to operate. So your job probably looks either like this. If you're a software engineer, your job looks like this, right? You live in some sort of world up there. If you deal with Erlang, you probably think your job is perfect. Um, <laughs> you are deeply flawed. Um, so. If your job is ops, you can replace yours with there in an engineering, software engineering job at the top. But job, ops's job looks like something like this, right? So they're responsible for packaging, deployment, uh, resource planning, capacity planning, disaster recovery, uh, root cause analysis. So this is a problem in the DevOps world because every single thing here affects every single thing there. Um, the, the idea of being able to do a root cause analysis on a product that's never been run before and will never be run again, um, we don't want to do that without the guy who wrote it. That just doesn't make any sense, right? So if I'm going to ship you a product and I'm going to have a 12-month life cycle on that and I have 10,000 other customers running it, that makes sense for me to be able to do root cause analysis on that without you. If I ship a product today and I have code changes and ship a new version tomorrow to all my users, I mean, Etsy deploys 
so it'd be 50, 60, 100 times, yeah, 50 times a day. The product is different tomorrow than it is today. So the idea of having something break and not having the guy or the lady who wrote the code in the room for the root cause analysis of that is just, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of everyone's time. So before I jump into what your job really looks like, um, magic operation pixie dust doesn't exist. Um, and a lot of people sell this. I um, mean, this is why I kind of hate the DevOps move, but, and I think it's kind of BS. People are like, oh, you have configuration management. It makes it all easy. You can just chef that stuff. You can puppet that stuff. You can use AWS, and I can just spin it up and shut it down. It's like, okay, um, <laughs> great. So provisioning virtual systems has become fast, cheap, and easy ever since they became virtual. Okay. That's not the cloud. That's virtualization, for one. So managing risk liabilities and risk and liabilities is simple, fast, and painless if you skip it. <laughs> right? So none of that changed. So the idea that you can just spin up machines and shut them down, you can do everything really quickly, you still have all of the compliance requirements that you have before you have all the security concerns that you have. Right? And if you're fast and fast and sloppy, you're probably exposing yourself in ways that you would find unconscionable in, in your environment before you adopted these things. So think about it this way. We have security. So anybody here a security expert? Awesome. I don't have to talk with you afterwards. This is great. So <laughs> security is not a feature. I'm sure everybody's heard something like this, right? Security is not a feature. Um, it's not a deliverable on a project plan, right? You cannot manage security that way. Um, it is not a phase two for a project. Um, this is the way gaping holes are left in software. Security is a state of mind. It's a state of being. It's a mentality. Right? Security is something that you have to take in mind every step of developing software, building infrastructure, building networks. You, you can't plug holes in the dam. You don't build a dam like Swiss cheese and then go figure out how to plug the holes before you put water behind it. Right? You build it from the ground up with all of the tolerances required to protect what's, what's, what's on the other side. And I claim that operations is really no different than that. You, it's, I mean, how many people here have gone into an environment that doesn't have very good systems? Yeah. You know, you know how hard it is to retrofit that? And how many holes are left five years later when something surfaces? Um, and it's because someone didn't have an operational mentality when they, were, when they were building that. So now back to your job. Your job actually looks like this. Right. And it's a team's job. But everyone needs to be aware of their influence on everything else. And it's really important that you start to learn those other technologies better. Right? The fact that you're doing operations, especially in the web world, and this is really key in the web world, you get paged at, at 4 AM, and you wake up because your monitoring system went off. Right? Um, maybe because you didn't do resource planning. Hopefully you did. Right? So you start looking at this. You start debugging. Um, you're doing network troubleshooting. Uh, the first thing you see is a JavaScript error, right? So what do you do? Do you stop? No, you should have the, the tools to go forward. You should be able to look at that and read the code. JavaScript is not different than any other language, really, except for Lang. So um, <laughs> the idea of once you kind of understand how computers work, all the languages start to look the same. So once you hit four languages, that you, you kind of can work with fluently and debug. Maybe not write a code, for, you know, a large piece of code from scratch, but if you can debug them, the fifth one starts to look like some sort of smearing of the other four anyway, right? And the point is not to be able to write code. The point is to be able to fix code, right? Especially in this world where we're deploying so quickly. We have engineers producing code, but when it's broken, you don't control where it's broken. It can be in JavaScript, it can be in the browser, it can be in your firewall, it can be in your load balancer, it can be in your switching and your routing, it could be in your, uh, your web app stack, if you have middleware, in your message queuing infrastructure, in your database, in your storage area network, your power distribution, right? It can be anywhere in that stack, and you can imagine how long it takes to solve one of those problems if you only have domain area expertise people. So, this is how some other companies work. And it's really bad unless you're a 20,000 person company. When, when the 3 a.m. calls out goes on, it goes through tier two support, which are underpaid college students who go, uh, it's blinking. 
it's not going off, and they escalate it up, and someone else gets paged, and then they start a war room conversation with 10 people, and they all argue about whose fault it is, right? <laughs> and that, it works, you know, and it takes two hours to solve a problem. I'm not saying it may go faster. I'm saying that certainly it's much more gratifying, and it's a much better experience for everyone when you have people that can simply say, it's not in that part of the stack. I'm going to go to that part of the stack. And you don't have someone else in the organization that goes, that's my turf, that's my job, get off. Get off my lawn. There's no get off my lawns in the, in the organization in DevOps. This means you're a generalist. And the bigger your sites are and the more traffic you push, as some of you are saying you do 40,000 requests a second. So I assume that's, I don't know, I assume that's on one server. So, so like if you're doing you know, 40,000 requests a second on one server, which is pretty well in the realm of a single server, you start to need to be able to debug kernel problems. You need to be able to de debug network stack problems, right? Is my 10 giggy driver unstable? Is my network, you know, is my network right? Do, you know, am I plugged into a brocade switch and I have negotiation problems, right? You need to be able to jump from these different portions of the stack and not be intimidated by the technologies because you don't know it. Nobody knows it, right? <laughs> That's why you have manuals. That's why you have a class on networking. It's like, it's not brocade switches, how do they work? It's networking, how does it work? How does layer two work? How does layer three work? How does IP work? How does TCP work? Um, how does my software install? How does it run? What is its model? Is it evented or threaded or forking? Like those are the building blocks that you have and then you get this big mental model of it. But if you get stuck in one of the pieces because you can't go to the next one because somebody in your organization says, get off my lawn, then you have a problem and you can't make progress. So the first rule is that whatever you build will break, period. So uh, you can build operational software. Uh, you must think operationally. And you start by turning the tables around. And this is, I think, catching on now a little bit more. I've been yelling at people enough about it. DevOps has really been putting about dev into operations. That's what it has been about for a while now. I think it started to turn about a year ago. All these software engineers came in. It was just, I'll, I will well, kind of over-exaggerate, but I did have a conversation like this once with a software engineer who I think was less capable than me, which is very frustrating. Um, they came in and said, all oh, these poor engineers, they just keep, they're just monkeys and they keep typing away, fixing the same problems. They don't know how to automate anything. They don't know how to stall anything. I have all of these tools, all these software engineering tools. I have all these processes. I have this agile and I have this code and I have this version control and I can just put it all together and I can solve all of their problems. And it was like, you don't have any idea what their problems are. Did you, did you do any research first? Like, what are they? They're like, well, I was a systems administrator. And I was like, no, I think you were a monkey that kept typing in the same commands. <laughs> you're not a systems administrator, right? That doesn't make sense. You're, you're not doing it. Most systems administrators do not spend time installing software. It's really boring, right? You're fixing problems that arise. This application is seg faulted. What do I do? I have a core file. I have to go interact with the vendor. I have to find a workaround. You know, um, I have a kernel issue. I have to downgrade the kernel because I just, you know, found a new issue in Linux 3.8 that was just released. Um, so what we really need to do is put balance back in by putting more ops into dev, um, which if you want to be confrontational, like I am, it's I'll deploy your code when it's operable, right? I don't care if it works. I don't expect it to work. I expect to be able to ask why it's not working. That's my expectation. When I deploy a piece of code, if I can put you as a you know, software engineer in front of it, and you go, you know what I think it is? I think it's that. Like, well, ask it. If you can't ask it, you didn't build your software right. Go back to the drawing board and build it, because you should be able to ask any piece of software how it's functioning right now. That's called telemetry, right? You should be able to output from a piece of software all of the vital statistics from that. How is it working? Can you imagine deploying a database where you're like, I think it's doing too many transactions per second. How many? I don't know. Uh, how would you tell? I can't ask the database that. I mean, it's like, really? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine deploying that? Can you imagine deploying a file system that couldn't tell you how full it was? Right? That, that doesn't really make sense. Yet, we deploy software all the time, these daemons that are just running, that take an input and give an output. The output stops happening, and you're like, well, the input's still going in. And they're like, mm. Right? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So we really need to get those software engineers to embrace um, building software that's more operable. So back to your organization. You probably have a CIO or a CTO that's responsible for operations. Um, uh, the titles don't matter. 
so much. COO, CIO, CTO. I like chief make it fucking run officer because um, <laughs> you can get that. Um, so someone has to make all of these things run and make them run better. And I think that in an organization that embraces DevOps, uh, you really get to be, it gets to be you, right? You have the power to do that because no one will keep you off their turf. So you can go add value wherever you think it, it's needed most. And this is usually most useful in troubleshooting exercises and debugging exercises. Obviously, you could be like a GitHub where it's like, I think our users want apples. I'm going to build apples today. And it's like, really, that's not on the product roadmap, seriously. Right? So most organizations have a lot more structure than that. And you, you are delivering on a goal. You are delivering on product roadmap features. But the idea that you can go in and work with another group. You can go in as a software engineer and sit down with a networking group and say, I want to learn more about how this is working and how I'm going to be abusing your systems because you're going to be angry with me later. Right? I better know up front. And the systems guys, how am I going to roll out Ruby? How am I going to manage multiple environments? How are we installing gyms? How are we packaging those? Are we not packaging those? Like all those questions, even if you're not in control of that, you need to be aware of how it's working. There are no surprises that way. Sometimes your input's valuable. Generally speaking, your organization doesn't hire stupid people. Um, if you think that they do, please don't think that you're the one exception. It's generally not the case. So um, if that is the case, right? So if the case is that your organization hires smart people, it's amazing how much insight someone can have in your job. You're at the same job with the same perspective, with the same group of people. If you program in Scala, everybody thinks like Scala. If you program like Java, everybody thinks like Java. You get a Scala engineer in the room with Java, and you're like, I wish you could do it like this. And they're like, I can't, but that's a really good idea. We should do it like this, right? Everything changes, and, and, and that sort of like crossbreeding is really important. So this is the mentality of the beginning of a career in web operations. Um, and if you don't do web operations, there's a hint that it's actually a career in anything. Right? So, and that's, that's it. If you want to follow me on Twitter for scotch and cigar updates, no, I'm just kidding. do that. Any questions? That's what I was going to ask. Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. What's Retro Ruby? Uh, it was this great conference that I went to on Saturday. Excellent. Not Ruby, Ruby. Back, back when gyms were uncompromised? Is that like Retro Ruby? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that retro. <laughs> Damn. Good old days. In the back. Do you find that do you think that company-wide kind of narrow-mindedness and groupthink like creates a kind of created culture, has created like a culture where like I only focus on my one job because I'm only really getting paid to do it, I'm burned on certain things, they only want me to do this, so I'm just gonna stay in my narrow little path. I I mean companies have cultures. So I mean, culture is not an overrated thing. I think it's it's not the only thing that's involved with that. I think some people blame culture for everything. I think companies have culture. They tend to hire people that resemble their culture. Um, if you're in a software or a software engineering organization, the amount of overzealous fanboy addiction to specific languages, any language doesn't doesn't matter which one is. If you want to change your culture, just change your your language. Change from Ruby to Java. Boom, your culture's done. Everybody will quit. I don't want to work in Java. It's like, oh, I thought you wanted to sell T-shirts. I thought you wanted to tell, sell T-shirts to people and be better than everyone else and build a better platform. I didn't realize that you wanted to, you know, like pick your nose with your left hand and your index finger, right? It's really specific, right? You want to use computers to do that. It doesn't really matter so much the language, but it, it is the case. It is a mentality. There is this narrow-mindedness that goes on. And I think that management tends to reinforce that. So if you have very specific um, performance review plans that are too narrow. Um, people feel like if they go outside, there's no incentivization, right? It's, it's only risk to go outside of that because they're never rewarded for adding value everywhere else. They're only punished for not meeting the, the bar. So uh, changing an organization's culture is really hard. So try to find one that matches you. I, I, I think that, uh, honestly, if you hire, you tend to not get hired into companies unless you will fit in their culture. 
So you need to ask yourself why you fit in where you work as well. Uh, government, that usually doesn't apply with government, right? Because there's just such a big machine yeah. that, you know. I just want the benefits. Don't generalize. What's that? I work for government. Don't generalize. They're big. They're a big machine. Do, do you, but does everyone in your organization have a really similar culture? No. That, that's that's what I meant. Is that they're big enough to really accommodate so many different, yeah. so diverse. I'll take that. Right. So when you get in a smaller organization that's like under four or five hundred people, there, there's so much top-down pressure on 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 how people interact and 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 what that culture is that you tend to self-assimilate in culture, which has the risk of self self-assimilating in thought as well. So. Just have to set the building on fire every once in a while. See what see what happens. <laughs> Cigars. Scotch. Scotch. Lit product with flammable product. It's a great way to set a building on fire. That's what I was getting at. <laughs> any any other questions? The, the best slide for me was when you realize you're a generalist at the end of the day. Yeah. You have to know the full stack, right? I mean, I'm gonna hijack your conversation a little bit, but like, so I, I fight the wall between products and in depth all the time, mm -hmm. where people are like, "Well, tell me what to do. I don't know, right?" And they haven't really thought through like, "Hey, there's a customer, and then we'll need your stuff, right?" They haven't thought through like, "Why am I even doing this? Why do I have a job? Like, what, who am I working for?" Um, and it's the same sort of thing. Like, you can't cross the stack. You can't make choices. I mean, because that's how you roll bubble. You're kind of useless. Yeah, I think I think DevOps in general helps break that bubble down in technology, but it hasn't really done enough to break it down across the company boundaries. Mm -hmm. So there's a now a really unified operations and engineering group not powering towards a business goal because they're not communicating well. So the whole the extending the full stack outside of technology into the business, into marketing, into into finance, right? There are operational decisions we make um, that we relegate into into um, to uh, accounting. Right? When I want to go buy a product, I suddenly stick them with some sort of CapEx or OpEx problem. And, and I could have known that ahead of time right? Um, and changed that. You know, I could have leveled the table and put them in a better position had I known that. Um, if some organizations don't want to talk about that. Usually, in any organization, no, how, no matter how big you are, if you want to take a finance out guy to lunch and buy him scotch, they will tell you anything. Right? They don't get to talk to anybody. They're like stuck in their holes, and they love to talk to people about business, and they love for you to be interested in it. So I think it's a, it's really good advice for people just to, to, to mix up and you know, social mixer in your company, not a fake one around beer, like a, a real one around conversation.